Hi everyone, um, this is an A-level video on populations and ecosystems, uh, AQA A-level biology, and it's related to predator-prey relationships, and particularly talking about predation and, and cycles between predator and prey. So this is very much related to interspecific and intraspecific competition, but more looking at relationships uh, in this case. So just a reminder, so predation is when an organism, the predator, kills and eats another organism, the prey. So in here, I've got two examples. A is a cheetah, so it can uh, sustain bursts of speed while chasing prey. And B is, is an orchid mantis, so species that lie in wait for their prey, are cryptically colored to avoid detection. So predators are supremely adapted to doing what they are doing in terms of eating or capturing and eating prey. And likewise, prey are um, also trying to be um, avoid being eaten to survive and reproduce. So there's a constant kind of um, survival of the fittest going on here in terms of natural selection. So traits associated with improve, improved predation or escaping predation tend to be positively selected. So in terms of prey, there are five main defence strategies. Now, before I start, in your AQA exam, they won't expect you to know about specific examples. They more than likely will give you some information uh, for you to work out what is going on. So let's look at prey defence strategies. The first thing to say is AQA uh, in the exam, they won't expect you to know any specific examples. So they more than likely would give you an example you've never seen before uh, and apply your um, knowledge from that. So uh, here's five main defence strategies. There are probably more, but these are quite common ones. So the first one is mimicry. So here we have a viceroy butterfly and it's a mimic and it's palatable to certain bird species, whereas a monarch butterfly is distasteful to certain species. So therefore the viceroy is, is um, benefiting from that coloration. Next one is protective covering. So there's many species that protect themselves. They can't actually uh, outrun or shelter away from certain predators. Therefore they have protective covering. So when they are attacked, it's very hard for the predator to kill them. So in this case, this is a pangolin. And also another good example is in the UK is a hedgehog. Um, next one, camouflage. So that speaks for itself. So this reptile is extremely camouflaged and therefore will evade capture by the predator. Uh, warning colours, there's two types, either the species is poisonous or it isn't poisonous. In this case, it's, this is a poisoned dart frog and it's definitely poisonous. Uh, and it's a warning coloration to generalised predators that it's not a good idea to eat this particular frog. Uh, and then finally is running fast. So ability to outrun their predators. So this is an impala. Impalas um, can run extremely fast, um, but more importantly, they can run fast for a sustained period of time. They're also very agile, so they can dodge out of the way. Uh, you can see this impala has large horns as well, which will help protect itself from being uh, predated upon. So here's another example of what we call aposomatic coloration. You wouldn't need to know that in an exam, but you do need to know um, in terms of the fact that it's an advantage, a selective advantage to these species. So a red spotted newt and a monarch butterfly, they warn potential predators against consumption, such as organisms contain toxins. Um, and it's very much related to something I'm going to talk about in a minute about uh, selective pressure. So there's, there's a move to evolve for better adap adaptations to avoid being eaten. And conversely, predators at the same time uh, need to capture sufficient food. So if they have any uh, adaptations over time, then they will have an advantage over the prey. Predator-prey cycles or predator-prey relationships usually take the same kind of uh, shape in a graph. They usually look something like this. They will obviously uh, vary 
from um, species to species, uh, but it's generally the same pattern. So if we just follow through, okay, so first of all, predators. So here is the dotted line is predators and the, the solid green line is prey. So you can see when predators eat prey, they redu it reduces the population of the prey and the population of the um, predator increases. Um, predator population will decrease eventually as there's not enough prey to um, allow that population of predators to remain. So fewer prey are eventually eaten and therefore they survive and reproduce and therefore increase the prey population. So with more prey, there is more food for predators. So populations then increase. You can see there's a lag between prey and predator. So predator always lags behind the prey. Um, in an exam, they might ask you to describe graphs. They might ask you to talk about uh, this particular lag between prey and predator. Now, this isn't straightforward. I mean, obviously, there are other factors externally that are going to affect prey and predator species populations, and those are called selection pressures. So external factors affect the size of a prey population, so affecting the predator population. So um, in your spec, in AQA, you don't need to know about density dependent and density independent factors, but it's worth knowing what other factors would affect um, predator prey relationships. And particularly, for example, nutrient supply, but also things like disease and pathogenic spread, accumulation of waste if the populations are too large, and then other things like natural disasters, uh, you might get extremes of weather conditions, and also abiotic factors affecting. Uh, you can remember the selection pressures through this mnemonic, and it's panda paw. Very interesting. OK, so let's have a look at some exam questions. So I'm going to show you an exam question. So, for example, this exam question. OK, and what I would like you to do is to have a read and pause and see if you can answer it. Before you do that, though, let's talk about what it wants you to show. So this is a six mark question here. So they show you some information about some lemmings and stoats, and they talk about uh, the changes in the number of lemmings and stoats from 1988 to 2000, so a nice scale on the bottom of years. They show the number of stoats and the number of lemmings per hectare, uh, and it's mapped out. And they say describe and explain the changes which occur in the lemming and stoat population. So just a reminder, describe is, is actually describing the curve, okay? Now, obviously, there's a lot going on between the lemmings and stoats. You need to describe it as simply as you can. Um, and then explain means give a biological reason why. So I'd like you to pause and see how you get on with the answer. Once you've finished, press play. Okay, so let's have a look at the answers. So the first thing to say about describing, I'll move myself over there, uh, describing. So if you look, there's, uh, you can see there is a four year cycle. So meaning that the cycle changes every four years. So predators, uh, the stoat peaks after the prey. So that's that lag. So the predator numbers peak after the prey. Uh, lemmings increase due to low numbers of stoats. So um, they increase because numbers are decreasing so lemmings increase there's more food for stoats so the numbers will then increase and increased predation reduces the number of lemmings and the number of stoats decreases due to the lack of food or starvation so it's a simple description and explanation okay so some questions um are and not just about describing, but suggesting explanations as well. So this is quite an interesting question about young fro uh, frogs and toads and investigating the effect of predation on three species of tadpoles. So they set up four artificial pond communities um, and each community tells you um, each community and then they added a different number of newts to each pond. OK, and then newts are predators. And it shows the effects of increasing the number of newts 
on the percentage survival of the tadpole of each species. So it actually shows the number of predatory newts per pond on the x-axis and the percentage survival of tadpoles on the y. So first question, it says, describe the effect of an increase in the number of newts on the percentage survival of the tadpoles of each of the toad species. Notice toad is in bold. That means you are just looking at the spadefoot toad and the southern toads. You're not looking at the spring peeper frog. So it's really important to pick up on that, that they just want you to talk about the toad species. So again, pause and see how you get on. I'd like you to try and answer that and then we will go through the answer. So pause now. OK, so remember a description, so description of each toad species. So all spadefoot toad species is quite easy because as the number of newts increases, the, the number of spadefoot toads decreases. We then look at the spring, uh, sorry, the southern toad. And you see the southern toad decreases down to where there is four predatory newts and then it slightly increases. So decrease in spadefoot toad and decrease in southern toad up to four newts per pond, then it increases at eight newts per pond. So that's just a description of what you can see. So the question then goes on to ask you, suggest an explanation for the effect of an increase in the number of newts on the percentage survival of the tadpoles of spring peeper frogs. So again, I'd like you to pause the video and have a go at the answers. So pause now. Okay, so looking at the graph for spring peeper frogs, you can see uh, that actually the numbers are quite, they actually increase and they stay quite stable, even though the number of predatory newts um, increases. So what it would suggest is that the predatory newts are not eating the spring peeper frog um, tadpoles. So the predators uh, are not eating, they're preying on the toads. Therefore, there is less competition for the spring peeper frog tadpole. So there's fewer toads also um, feeding on frogs as well, because toads feed on frogs. But there's less competition and there's more food. OK, so it says here, allow first mark if reference is made to either toad species being eaten by the, by the newts. Um, answer simply stating that newts are increasing and toads are decreasing are not sufficient. So you've got to give a bit more detail. Okay, so this next question is using both figure one and figure two. And figure two shows how the masses of the tadpoles were affected in each pond during the investigation. So you can see the mean mass uh, tadpole on the y-axis. So spadefoot toad, you can see the mass slightly increases. Spring peeper frog, there's a large increase in mass, even with an in increase of, num of predatory newts. And southern toad, again, there is a quite stable and increasing level of um, mass so, so it's not about the numbers it's about the mass mean mass of the tadpoles so it says use the information provided in figure one explain the results obtained in figure two so i'd like you to have a look at both data and try and answer that question for two marks so if you can pause please so basically there is as we can see from figure one there's fewer toads or tadpoles the more newts there are. So if, if there's fewer toads or tadpoles, though, they're still going to be there and there's going to be more food. So they're going to be larger and they're going to increase in mass. So it's really important to uh, state that information that the few remaining tadpoles, they're going to be larger. That's why you've got a greater mean mass. OK, I um, hope you found that useful. Please do subscribe to Dot Biology and I will see you soon.